Welcome, everyone. It's Angelo Robles, host of the Angelo Robles podcast and the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. We have a great guest today, as I, of course, I always do. And that would be Mark Tinker, the Chief Investment Officer and Managing Director of Tusca Fund HK Limited, part of Tusca Fund Asset Management LLP, a London-based specialist, asset management, and investment firm with around $5 billion in U.S. assets. He is also the founder of Market Thinking Limited. Mark, welcome to the show today. I'm pleased to be here. Nice to meet you, Angela. My pleasure. So your blog at Market Thinking claims to make sense of the narrative. How would you characterize the prevailing market narrative in 2022, and how is it shifting as we're very close to year end? Well, we try to make sense of the narrative. That's what we're trying to do. We try to understand what's driving markets at all times uh, and try and make sense of it because there's so much noise uh, in markets and we try to work out what's happening. So what's really, in our view, we've been going on this year, has been normalising. Uh, the markets have been normalising interest rates after a very, very unusual period. We forget, because it's been 14 years now of uh, quantitative easing. Uh, and that has led to all sorts of distortions of markets. And so what we're actually doing now is we think we're raising interest rates. What we're doing is putting interest rates back to a normal level. And that is having all sorts of consequences within financial markets themselves. Uh, in particular, uh, obviously, it's, uh, it's affected both bonds and equities through the, the discount rate factor. So we've had a, we've had a deleveraging and a derating of markets. And mixed in with that, and I think it's very, very important to separate, we've got used to... In Interest rates giving us a signal of what's going to happen to the economy. But interest rates give us a signal because they tell us what's happening next to the money supply. But we had 14 years where interest rates were apparently telling us we had very loose monetary conditions and therefore inflation must be coming sooner or later, and it never did. What we've had, of course, is, is that post-COVID, um, we, we got a huge fiscal stimulus, which was effectively monetized by the central banks, and that's what brought us inflation. But what is important this year and where the narrative is now changing is that in April, May, the Fed realized, recognized the importance of what was going on and they slowed down that money supply expansion very, very aggressively. So what we've now got baked in, like we had inflation baked in from two years ago, we've now got a recession pretty much baked in coming through in 23, 24, but it's a very unusual style of recession. So again, the narrative is, is shifting around from being all about inflation to now talking about uh, a slowdown uh, and a recession. But for us, within markets, it's the way that changing interest rates profile, that changing uh, yield curve profile is affecting different sectors, uh, different uh, areas of the markets, different parts of the capital market structure. And it's not just about the don't fight the Fed narrative that's going on. We think actually that um, uh, the discount rate has already changed so that now we shouldn't be just watching the short term interest rates. We should actually be looking at the, at the broader markets. So, um, yeah, so what we've, we've now got is a year coming up. Sorry, can we start with this again? I'm really, really sorry. Um, I've just got, got myself a bit caught up. I do, I do apologize. Oh, it's all good. Actually, that was a, a pretty deep description that allows me to give some follow-up questions in terms of what you said. So yeah. I look at it yeah. more as an investor than an economist or macro thinker of, I think we're in pretty bad times. I'm just looking here at the US, which is probably in better shape relative to the dollar than other parts of the world. We have a massive deficit we don't have enough revenues via taxes to pay that down. Arguably, we could inflate our way out, but that's going to come with a lot of pain. Uh, coupled with interest rates being what they are, although somewhat normalizing is the word that you may use, coupled with inflation, like you argued, might have been baked in. Like I just see that we still have a world of hurt here in the, U in the U.S. Where am I wrong? Uh, well, yeah, exactly. You're not wrong. Um, uh, but I think what's happened is, is that, I guess, so because, of, because of all this stuff with the, uh, with the technology, I've just got, got myself a little, uh, a little out of sync because I wrote lots and lots of stuff down today and I've, I've jumped to the end of my script rather than the beginning of my script, if you see what I mean. So, um, yeah, I, so I think the, the important, 
I would want to make uh, in the in this first uh, this first part of it is it is about normalizing um, because you, know, you jump onto the, the questions that you had about uh, the zero the triple zeros uh, because we had this unusual period because we had zero COVID came on the back of zero interest rates. What we then got was the inflation that hadn't occurred for the previous 15 years, in contrast to a lot of people's kind of expectations. The Fed's move is actually not around interest rates, which is where we're always looking because it's been our shortcut for what's going to happen to monetary policy. We need to put monetary policy itself, which basically was very, very loose in 2021, and the markets boomed on the back of that. And now it's tightened very aggressively, so therefore the markets have come down on the back of that. Uh, and so, yes, we have got a recession coming, but I would argue that in many senses, the, um, uh, the markets have already priced that in. So the economic environment is not going to be great, particularly in the West. Um, hence, we link, link on to stuff about Asia where they haven't had this same sort of boom and bust side of things. Um, so if we might just start that again. Um, or I, uh, I could, no, I could, that uh, was... That was all good. It would help a little bit, Mark, if you could lower your camera slightly. Part of your face is being cut off. Yeah, yeah. So my, 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 that, my, uh, uh, now the I opposite. Go a little higher. There, there. That's good. Per oh, yeah. Don't judge. Okay. <laughs> okay, now I'll have to because I'm going to prop something underneath it. So it's a bit low tech. Yeah, this is my iPad at the moment. So there we go. Is that okay. better? Yes, yes, that is better. So, like a follow up of that you're basically saying we're heading into a recession. If I follow the definition of two consecutive quarters of negative growth, which we had, I believe, in the second and third quarter, maybe I'm a little off on that, that is a recession. So are we just extending what we're already in? Yeah, I think basically we've got a pretty sharp uh, economic slowdown as essentially the, we unwind almost you know, 14, 15 years of badly aligned monetary policy, which had created uh, a kind of a false economy. It, it, it had created a lot of zombie companies, it created excess supply everywhere. It had had the very, very opposite of, of what you would intend from, uh, from any of your policies. So instead of causing inflation, it caused an excess supply and zombie companies. It basically made the West like Japan. It created this whole environment of, uh, of a distorted economy and we're normalizing away from that. So that means a lot of deleveraging. It means people have made money out of being um, uh, essentially running a carry trade, borrowing cheap money from the central bank, uh, leveraging up a balance sheet and creating a sort of a financial economy rather than actually manufacturing or producing anything, um, did really, really well. Now that's all going in reverse. So we're having a slowdown as all that kind of uh, false economy unwinds. So yeah, two consecutive quarters of GDP growth, yeah, technically that's what is a recession but what we're coming to now is a, a big unwind it is a, a deleveraging of financial markets so the deleveraging of the broader economy itself which is essentially the uh you know we've seen it over history you know when you get interest rates held at below the normal level for a long period of time you get real distortions in the economy and as we normalize you know the first shall be last and um you know th these this whole process is is now unwinding and it's going to be worse in places such as parts of Europe, Australia, New Zealand, where interest rates were very low, particularly for consumers who built up huge amounts of mortgage debt on floating rates. And so as the interest rates normalize, that's going to be really painful uh, for those particular economies, less so for the US, where people have the ability and many have got quite long fixed rate mortgages, less so for Asia, where the same uh, situation is not true, where they didn't have huge cheap interest rate stimulation to the economy for multiple years so they didn't really have the boom so they're not really going to have the bus that goes with it so i think it's we've got geographical shifts we've got sector shifts we've got between the consumer and the producer so there's all sorts of, of moving parts going on here as we go through this normalization period and so yeah you can call that a slowdown you can call that a recession but it's it's much more kind of complicated than a simple watch that gdp go down and then bounce back up again do you think in 2023 you could go from a recession to a depression? I'm not sure about a depression. Uh, I think um, yeah, for certain sectors, yeah. Uh, but no, I, I think there's what we have to also remember is we are very, very focused. We've, we've got used to being focused on the developed world versus the emerging world. And one of the, uh, the big themes for 2023 is that the, the uh, emerging world 
you know, particularly China, particularly Asia, um, will continue to grow. Uh, there'll be a big differential between the West and the rest. Uh, and there's going to be a really big differential between the funding uh, of the West and the funding of the rest. And, you know, we've got used to everything being done in dollars. You know, one of the big stories uh, for next year, I think, is going to be the ongoing uh, de-dollarization of, you know, the 7 billion people that don't exist in the West. Uh, they will, they'll use the dollar less and less for trade um, and they'll trade between themselves and that's going to create a whole new financial system. If we are interested in financial markets, we've got to understand that you know, an enormous amount of the world's activity is going to take place outside of the, of the uh, kind of the little universe we've got used to operating in. Well, I was going to jump into that later in the interview, but because you brought it up, I think that is important. An advantage the U.S. has had for many, many, many decades is basically the world, for the most part, settles in dollars. And the dollar is doing relatively well, which also means that emerging markets are probably being gravely challenged because of that. I guess it's inevitable the dollar's dominance won't last forever. Perhaps there'll be a basket of securities, something we could get into if you want. But it's still at this moment, it's dominant. So I've been saying what you're saying may happen over three, five, seven, ten years. You're giving me the impression that that may happen sooner than I think. Why? Well, I think there's a lot of bilateral trade. And there's, there's several things that have led us uh, to, to this situation. Um, one of which, if you think about wait, why, why do you why do we go to work? We go to work in order to earn money to buy things that we can't or don't want to uh, produce ourselves. And it's the same with countries. The reason that China exports $100 billion worth of goods to America is so it has $100 billion to buy um, energy with, essentially, primarily oil. But now, uh, since uh, the, uh, the Ukraine war, um, China increasingly is, is buying its commodities, particularly its energy, um, in bilateral trade deals, I just saw one recently with the, the Saudis, and you can guarantee that that wasn't going to be done in dollars. It'll be done in RMB. And the thing is, if, if you can do that, you can just print RMB, so therefore you don't need to do all those exports. So that's something that we have to bear in mind, you know, that, that we're not going to benefit from the, the um, sort of subsidised almost exports uh, from Asia because they don't need to earn dollars to buy their energy with. And the second thing is, uh, I'm afraid to say that, you know, the the um, post the uh, invasion again, when, when you freeze $300 billion of, of FX reserves, you send up a really uh, big warning signal. People say, well, you've got to be careful if you, uh, you trade with us and you can, uh, we'll hold on to the money that we're supposed to pay you for the things that we're buying off you. But if uh, you upset us uh, on foreign policy, um, um, we're not going to pay you. So that's going to be a real challenge for the US. Who is going to essentially buy uh, all those treasuries? Uh, and that's obviously a concern for financial markets because it kind of suggests that it's at some point it's got to be the Fed. And so they've got to go back to printing money again. Uh, and that then undermines the, uh, the status of the dollar um, because essentially uh, you've got the old things we used to talk about back in the 90s of the twin deficits. You've got a current account deficit and you've got a, a government spending deficit and you're printing dollars to cover it. And the more dollars you print, you know, obviously the, the, the less... Uh, value they become to people outside of that dollar zone. So, you know, with the world outside of the West stepping outside of the dollar zone, uh, there's going to be some really quite uh, significant uh, changes going on in markets themselves. This is a medium term view, but it's already starting uh, and the consequences will be felt long before we actually lose full status of the, of the dollar as a reserve currency. Yes, I don't necessarily disagree, but for the emerging economies to decouple I guess you could say from the dollar is also going to be painful for them in many ways. But we could jump back into that subject a little later. I'm going to bounce into what you briefly brought up there mm. and I brought up maybe two times already. We have a massive deficit here in the U.S. and other, at least Western countries, are similar relative to their country GDP and size. Like, am I overly concerned about the deficit? Maybe I am. Like, how is it just going to magically go away without really high inflation? Oh, well, there's the, yes. I mean, obviously, you know, the uh, history would suggest that inflation is the best way of, of getting rid of it. But here's another angle. What, one of the things that is going on at the moment is a big, big chunk of the, the U.S. current account deficit is defense expenditure. 
Now, one of the things that's going on is um, uh, the government deficit defense expenditure is that uh, NATO, as in non-US, is increasingly paying for that defense expenditure. So in other words, the US is getting uh, its allies to help uh, pay for uh, its budget deficit as associated with, uh, with a lot of that defense. And the second thing that's going on, of course, with the trade deficit is that um, those same allies are paying three times as much to buy gas from, uh, uh, from the US as they, uh, as they previously were buying it from Russia. So actually, there's, um, you, you could argue that uh, recognizing those twin deficits, the, uh, the American administration is uh, getting its friends and allies to put their hands in their pockets to, to help bail it out, um, which is, uh, again, uh, something that uh, I'm not sure the uh, people in those countries have really thought through. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a good point. I mean, I've always said about defense, and my audience knows I'm on the conservative libertarian side. It always looks like it's too much money until the day that you need it. And with challenges from China, Russia, and other countries out there, uh, I am definitely a big supporter of defense. We have to do way better on ballistic missiles uh, and hypersonic, if that's the right word that I'm looking for. But again, I don't want to make it a military discussion, but I'm glad you brought it up in a little bit of commentary there. Uh, you bring many years of developed market experience in your observance of China as the country's economy seeks to harness the benefits mm -hmm. of the capital markets. Is China still committed to a market economy and can it coexist within the autocratic CCP? I think, yeah, it's very important is that um, I think one of the biggest problems that, that Western observers have with China is that um, uh, they, they misunderstand what has been going on and China has been building its economy. And, and they've made assumptions uh, that actually haven't turned out to be true. And actually, if we listen, uh, the Chinese told us it uh, wasn't going to happen. So if we go back, let's just, um, we don't have, have to go all the way back uh, to when China first joined the World Trade Organization. We can go back to 2012. Uh, when Xi came in with his reforms. And the very, very interesting point that Xi made when he first arrived was to say that as far as he was concerned, where the market can set prices, it should be allowed to set prices. So he was very much focused on the market delivering the information uh, for the, uh, the, the authorities to manage that giant economy. And what we're thinking about China actually is it's about the size of Europe and it's got essentially uh, a whole set of regions which are as big as any of the European nation states. Uh, and it's, the CCP is actually like the EU would like, it, like itself to be. So in other words, the, the CCP is the sort of bureaucracy that sits on top of all those, those regional uh, economies. Uh, and because it has power uh, and it has central planning power, it can deliver the high-speed rail and the infrastructure and all the things that have actually been going on over the last 10 or 15 years, which has not been able to happen uh, in, in Europe because the EU does not sit fully above the countries and does not happen in the US because, of course, the federal government doesn't sit fully above the states either. So the structure is actually uh, quite a, uh, a free market one in a way because the individual uh, regions... Uh, uh, operate as their own economies with this sort of overarching uh, bureaucracy, which is unelected, uh, but it's not as authoritarian as people think. Uh, there's lots of um, sort of competition and there's lots of rivalries and there's, there's lots of politics within it um, that uh, are actually quite similar to what we, we, we see in the West. So what we've got, the first term that, uh, that Xi had, essentially he called the Chinese dream, the China dream. We thought that was the same as the American dream. We, we thought basically American consumers wanted to, uh, so US Chinese consumers wanted to uh, be in other emerging markets. They wanted to import lots of uh, consumer goods from the West whilst their farmers all moved from the, from the farms into factories that we would own and produce goods and services that they'd sell to us uh, in return for money. And then they could buy goods back from us. They thought, you know, we thought that China was going to be the biggest emerging market ever. And so we put that um, idea on top of China. And China basically said, no, no, we're not doing that. We're not going to let you own the factories. We're not going to have a, a fully floating exchange rate. We're not going to play that Washington consensus game that we all got used to. If you're, if you're investing in emerging markets, you kind of knew the routine. You know, the first five years, you know, all the consumers came in from the fields, they worked in the factories and they borrowed money. 
money and they took out mortgages and they bought consumer goods from either other emerging markets or directly from the West. Um, and then we got the, then, then this phase two came in, which is when the capital markets came in. So the capital markets then come in, basically, you'd have stock exchanges and bond markets and you'd have, you know, all the essentially public goods would, uh, would then get floated on the stock market. So you'd have the telecom companies and you'd have the banks, you'd have the electricity, et cetera, et cetera. And they then all end up being owned by overseas investors. And you'd have a boom and a big inflationary boom, and then you'd have a collapse and a bust. And then ultimately um, the Western investors would walk away owning all the key assets. Uh, and the sort of the band would roll on to the next emerging market. Now, the first five years, as I said, we thought was going to be classic. And she said no, and it turned out not to be. The second five years of G's term, same thing. We all assumed that um, what China needed now was more Western financial markets. And China has made it quite clear that's not what it wants. It doesn't mean it doesn't have its own way of, of building out its financial system. Um, in fact, it's, uh, it's very busy doing that. But it just doesn't want to let the West end up owning the factories or owning any of the public goods. And that was the big story of last year. That was a big narrative of last year, Angela. It was, was the... Um, when suddenly uh, the magical thinking behind the ADR stocks uh, was exposed, the idea that these stocks were 100% owned by the Westerners and also 100% owned by the Chinese, um, all blew up uh, back in the middle of uh, August 21. Uh, and that process pretty much unwound during the, the last quarter of this year, uh, as uh, essentially most Western owners of those Chinese ADR stocks, you know, the Alibabas, et cetera, essentially gave up. And then in the last month or so of, uh, of 2022, all those stocks bounced sort of 30 or 40 percent as the Chinese um, investors and the Asian investors um, bought them up, as we would say in markets, they moved from uh, weak hands to strong hands. So it's, China has not abandoned markets. It uses markets in a different way that the West does. Uh, it's not going to allow uh, rentiers, for want of a better word, it's not going to allow people to come in and leverage up, uh, borrow lots of money, uh, and uh, effectively um, uh, put lots of leverage on the balance sheets and extract lots of value out of the corporates, as has tended to happen in the West. Uh, it very much wants to retain ownership, but I think what's very important is that they uh, they're happy to cooperate. If we in the West can help China. Uh, set the prices in the markets that allow them to understand where the real demand and supply is, they're very happy to operate. But what they're not going to do is essentially sell the family silver um, for a short-term gain uh, and then, uh, then allow uh, outsiders, if you like, to own key parts of, uh, of the Chinese economy. A very comprehensive answer and some good points and things that I could perhaps learn from. I'm going to push back maybe a little bit here and there relative to that. Amazing what China has done in, what, 40 to 50 years and really especially the last 25 years. Uh, very impressive from, you know, from where they came from to being a world power and amazing people in China. And really, I so look forward to visiting. I meant to do it two years ago, but obviously something came up at that point that made it very hard. <laughs> three years ago, whatever, I lost track of time now, but I, I hope to do so a trip to Asia, as well as the Middle East, actually, this upcoming year, and that'll be very exciting. But, and again, maybe I'm looking at it through my lens, China is a communistic country. Look what happened to Jack Ma. Look what's happening to people that don't follow the party line. Uh, they're, to me, they appear to be puppets, effectively, of the CCP. And if they don't fall in line, then very bad things could happen to them. Now, in theory, does that happen in Western countries too? Uh, yeah, the reality is countries, governments have a monopoly on violence. I could go further. Why don't I stop there, but hear your feedback on that? Yeah, I, mean, Jack, the, I think the, Jack Maher is a very interesting example because I think essentially it goes to my previous point, which is that in China, you are allowed to be rich and you're allowed to be very rich, but what you're not allowed to do is to take that wealth and use it to try and influence politics. Now that's, you know, obviously the opposite of the model that we see particularly in the US where obviously very rich people get heavily involved in politics. Uh, and we have the, the idea, we have the lobbying world where essentially large corporates who in America, obviously you have 
the law that a corporate counts as a person. Um, and the large corporates spend lots of money to try and essentially create monopolies for themselves, um, deliver, deliver excess returns by having monopoly pricing. So China, you can call it communist, you can call it socialist, whatever you want to, they call it, they call themselves socialist. Um, is essentially what they're saying is, is that you, know, you, can, you can make good money, but only if you make good products. And what you can't do is create a monopoly by uh, using political influence that enables you to exploit the people. This is their whole concept of common prosperity. So that was really the, the, the statement that was being made is, yes, you can be rich. Uh, and we're very happy for you to be rich, but when you start uh, trying to influence politics, that's when you know, that's when we draw the line. And so that is a different uh, environment, but it is one that investors can operate within as long as you understand those are the rules. Um, and I think there's a lot of quite clear signalling comes out from uh, the CCP if we choose to listen to it. And I think that's my sort of broader point. It's a different system. There's lots of people outside of the West that are actually looking at it and seriously questioning, does this work better for us than the existing system? Um, the Washington consensus, as I describe it, has kept many emerging markets emerging, uh, but never actually emerged for many years. And they're looking at the fact that the way China has emerged is it hasn't quite played the game. It hasn't allowed foreign ownership of its economies. It hasn't um, you know, uh, allowed uh, rich people to buy their way into politics and so on. Um, and so, yes, yeah, it's a different model, um, but it doesn't mean it's going to fail. And I think that's the other thing we have to bear in mind is it uh, just because they're not doing it our way, it doesn't mean uh, they're suddenly going to come to their senses and, uh, and, uh, and adopt the way we've done everything. And uh, we can still invest alongside them, I believe, uh, and we can still make good money as long as you understand that for them, it's a win-win situation. Unless they get something out of it, um, they, they're not interested. I mean, I am of the belief that there are powers that be, and I'm, as you can imagine from my ideology, I'm not a big fan of the, F, <laughs> of the IMF, and I do think there's forces at work outside of the U.S. and probably in the U.S. as well, well, I see that already, that are in my opinion, nefarious. Uh, I have very different opinions than you on that, but I do want to be respectful of your opinion, and there may be things that I could learn from. Uh, one more question relative to that, because I know it's not all rosy uh, in China, per the things that I brought up. They do have an issue with an aging population, and they've tried to reverse that for at least 10 years now. I'm assuming incentives to younger people to have kids, and really around the world, outside of a couple of small pockets, this has been a major, major challenge. Basically, younger people are not as motivated to have kids the way they used to back in the day. And how is China going to address that issue moving forward? Yeah, yes, they have got an aging population. Obviously, there's, there's uh, the legacy of the one-child policy, uh, and that has been unwinding for a while. I think the, uh, the bigger thing that's going on is they are and again, importantly, from a financial point of view, is they're trying to build a proper kind of social security pension uh, savings uh, security net. Uh, savings in, in China are very, very large. It's one other area that are very different from traditional emerging markets. They don't actually need foreign capital. They've got plenty of savings. What they actually need is for the savings to go to the right place. Uh, and um, that's really been the story of the last 15 years. Uh, has been building a domestic financial infrastructure rather than piggybacking off the Western financial infrastructure. And as part of their recognizing that if you think about it right now, you've got one child with six, uh, six people looking after them, i.e. You know, mum and dad, and then uh, two sets of grandparents. That will flip so that that one child is having to look after uh, six people. Uh, and that's actually the bigger challenge. Um, and so what they need to do is, is to build out a, uh, a pension and life insurance system that will enable those um, grandparents and certainly the parents to make provision uh, for their old age rather than to rely on you know, the, the single salary of the, uh, uh, of the single child. Because, of course, you know, um, when, the, when they get married, they, they, their spouse will be in exactly the same position on the other side. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it is one of these things that you know, all Western countries, uh, unless you've got large amounts of immigration, are, are uh, 
struggling with an aging population. Uh, a lot of economists seem to believe that the solution is unlimited uh, immigration, uh, which is something that um, uh, I think is uh, quite controversial uh, in, in, in the real world. Um, but that's a, a broader issue which doesn't necessarily affect China, but again, is seriously affecting Europe, for example. Uh, that proposed solution uh, assumes that GDP of itself is a target as opposed to GDP per capita. And I think that's another important statement uh, from, from China is uh, they, they target uh, a doubling of GDP per capita uh, between uh, now and 2030. Um, so it's you know, they're, they're very much focused on, on, on the, the per capita aspect, which is, is exactly all right. And I, I'm not saying everything is perfect in China at all, but I think if we want to uh, invest in China, we want to understand what the biggest economy in the world is doing and how it's going. What we, we need to do is step away from looking at it through a Western lens and say they need to do it like this because this is the way we did it or the way we want it to be done uh, and recognize that they have their own agency and they're doing things differently. But there, is a, there are ways that Western investors can, and I think should, uh, participate. Uh, if you're taking a medium to long-term view, um, you, know, you really need to look at what they're doing, listen to what they're saying, rather than just follow the forecasts of, uh, of the traditional Western uh, sort of uh, think groups uh, who uh, just assume everything is gonna be exactly as it was with, with South America, Latin America, Asia and all other emerging markets going in that kind of short term, uh, short term boom bust cycle. It's a much longer term story coming out of China. Oh, we did hint at it earlier. Uh, are you a bear on the US dollar? And if so, why? Well, I, th I think there's two, two aspects of it. One of which is, uh, we, as we hinted at earlier on, is, is that the, uh, the, the twin deficits mean the US is going to struggle. Uh, to, uh, to finance itself without essentially printing a lot more dollars. Um, and the, the kind of shorter term aspect of it is that the dollar was sort of artificially very, very strong during the course of this year. Most people at the beginning of 22 saw the longer term weakness in the dollar uh, and were caught out uh, to some extent uh, by that, that, that sudden spike. If you look at this sort of the trade weighted index, you know, it jumped you know, from below 100 you know, up to like 115. Uh, and the actual the dollar strength was actually one of the dominant stories for returns right. uh, last year. Certainly, if you're part of the US, uh, having US dollars was your uh, your best returning asset uh, in that market. But I think there were a couple of things that were driving that, uh, in particular, the deleveraging. Um, people were running carry trades everywhere, as we'd known in that whole period of, of uh, low interest rates. Uh, and they had to essentially close out that carry trade when they saw that the Fed retiring, they saw the money supply was... Yeah, so I'll just say that the, the, the part of the strength of the dollar was actually people having to um, close out their, uh, their carry trades. Uh, and they also had the situation like back in April, uh, sort of March, April, when uh, the big Japanese life companies, they're hedging, they found themselves massively overhedged, slightly technical situation, but you buy... You know, hundred billion dollars worth of U.S. Treasuries, and you you go short hundred billion dollars to hedge out your currency. If your Treasuries fall in value by 10, 15 percent, as they did in Q1, you're overhedged. Uh, so essentially, you have to buy back, you know, fifteen billion dollars worth of uh, worth of dollars. Um, and that trend was one of the reasons why the yen was so weak uh, in the first quarter against the dollar. The second quarter. The Europeans had to print a lot more euros in order to buy the expensive energy, thanks to the uh, the Ukraine war. And by then, you had a very strong momentum developing in the dollar um, that continued essentially all the way through uh, until the end of end of the third quarter. Uh, and the, if you like, the the narrative was very powerful. The dollar was going up forever. Everybody was terrible. It was the least dirty shirt, and all those expressions that you heard from all the short term traders. Um, but that seems to have kind of come to a bit of a, a stall. Uh, and I think the narrative, uh, we talk about trying to make sense of narrative, I think the narrative is going to roll over into 2023. 20, uh, and people are going to start to say, well, if the dollar doesn't keep going up, maybe I've got a bit too many dollar assets. I need to diversify. I need to look at the parts of the world as we've been discussing, uh, particularly Asia, that haven't had the boom and aren't going to have the bust because they haven't had that kind of crazy zero 
interest rates followed by zero COVID um, uh, boom bust environment that uh, that has hit the West. Um, and actually, you know, tie that with the second story for next year, which is China did have zero COVID, and it's now coming out of that. So actually, I think assets are going to flow from the safety of dollars and from that kind of overbought position. So I think short term, the dollar will come back from an overbought uh, position and then medium term, people will start to focus on those problems with the twin deficits um, and the need to print ever more dollars to fill that hole uh, in the absence of a cutback in, uh, in government spending. Um, and, um, and an increase in exports, which again, uh, may well happen. Uh, but uh, in the short term, I think it will make people uh, bearish on the dollar. Are you in the Russell Napier camp that sees inflation as a necessary solution to over-indebted government balance sheets? A subject that I did touch on earlier, but this will be more of a direct question. Yeah, I mean, Russell's a great guy um, and he's a very good economist and he's a very good economic historian. And uh, I wouldn't disagree with the, his assessment that ultimately uh, this is the way that these problems always end up getting solved. Uh, and I think we are seeing this uh, with inflation. I don't think we have to get hyperinflation, but I do think it is um, at, least, at least a subconsciously acknowledged policy uh, that inflation is kind of the only way that you get out of these uh, uh, these balance sheet problems that have been built up by successive governments uh, yeah. over the last 15, 20 years. Um, so, yeah, I think that the, the, the level of inflation steps up uh, a level. I, I'm not, but I'm not a big buyer of the, of the hyperinflation. I think what we did have was a distorted level of disinflation. So we had prices coming down because there was too much supply of everything. Um, we're not going to get that uh, excess supply of everything. So the sort of the, the base level of inflation, I think, is going to be higher, and that will uh, wear away at the uh, at the balance sheets uh, and uh, essentially uh, restore uh, restore the health. But I, th I think it's I don't think it's going to be a short sharp shock version of it. I think it's going to be a, a steady erosion, and it does raise the question of you know what value bonds even at these levels. <laughs> well, that leads perfectly indirectly into my next question. Uh, Mark, what is the role, if any, for bonds in a long-term investment portfolio? Well, it's, it's, it's a tricky one now because basically uh, what's happened for the last 15 years is that, that they ceased to actually do what they're supposed to do, which is provide income and stability. And they actually became uh, this sort of upside down world where you held equities for income and, and bonds for capital <laughs> gains. Um, the, uh, and now... Now you do have a better yield on bonds. The problem is, however, you've got an actually even better yield right now on cash. So if you're holding the very short end, pretty much cash as part of your barbell, I can, I can see the sense in cash has now come back as an asset that is worthwhile having some amount in your portfolio. It's obviously not the 40% that bonds used to uh, function in a traditional 60-40 portfolio. If you think that the um, uh, essentially the... Uh, uh, the, the Fed is going to stop raising rates and that will cause a rally in bonds. It'll cause an even bigger rally um, in, uh, in equities uh, and other long duration assets. So in other words, bonds suffered as long duration assets as the discount rate rose towards normal levels. Uh, but so did, uh, so did growth equities. Uh, and if uh, anything that's going to be good for bonds uh, on the capital gain side, I would argue will be even better for equities. Uh, and in the meantime, um, what you've got a lot of a problem with is um, a lot of people had this kind of strange, again, barbell where they had, um, uh, for their fixed income, they had very illiquid so-called alternatives uh, in terms of some of these kind of infrastructure, private equity, private credit, uh, and, they had, and, uh, and also junk bonds. Um, and we saw with the LDI uh, issues in the UK at the end of September, um, there's an awful lot of institutional money which is sat there in things that they've been told are low risk because they have low apparent volatility and that's apparently the only thing that matters. And yet embedded within those products is all sorts of illiquidity and all sorts of leverage. And when people get called on that leverage, as happens in a recession, um, 
then you get some very unpleasant unwinds. So I would be very wary of the credit end of fixed income. Uh, I can't see much real value in the in the sovereign end, to be perfectly honest. But um, a lot of people buy bonds because they have to under their mandates. If you don't have to, I can't really True. see uh, the point of, of, of having uh, anything longer than a very short dated, um, very short dated bonds and cash. Which parts of the Chinese market may provide the greatest upside for wealthy families and family offices with long term time horizons? I think it's important if you're if you're looking at China to understand, as we've been discussing, that you know, China does have a kind of a win win mentality. And if you can see uh, a business where uh, you can bring something to the party, particularly if, as an just as a straight investor, you can bring some sort of pricing understanding, valuation understanding uh, that you can participate. But uh, you also have to understand that. Um, as, again, as discussed, that China isn't going to tolerate people who are going to try and create monopolies in order to exploit the Chinese consumer as they see it. This is their common prosperity. So I'd be wary of investing in any company whose uh, sort of business model requires them becoming a sort of a dominant, uh, a dominant player who can then uh, push up pricing. So understanding what sorts of business the uh, Chinese uh, authorities will allow to prosper, and as I said, you can be rich, you can be very rich, but you mustn't start messing around in politics. So be wary of who you are backing. Um, secondly, uh, China is expanding uh, its infrastructure, both internally and externally. Uh, and obviously this one belt, one road. Again, in the West, a lot of people are, are kind of want it to fail and are saying it's a very terrible thing, but actually it continues as a very, very powerful uh, economic force. Um, and participating in either the funding of that one belt, one road, or participating in people who benefit from the infrastructure once it's been built. Uh, I think those are the sort of attractive ways to, uh, uh, to get involved in, uh, in Chinese assets. And, and recognize, I guess, let me put it this way, there's a difference between, if you like, um, financial capitalism, which is what unfortunately we've been doing for the last 20 or so years in the West, which is all about playing with people's balance sheets and leveraging things up and extracting kind of returns that way. And industrial capitalism, which is building things and constructing things and funding them in the sort of more traditional 19th century Western way, uh, which is a lot of what's going on in Asia, not just China. A lot of what's going on in Asia is you know, they're, they're building things and they're selling them to people, whereas, as opposed to just playing around with balance sheets. So focus on real assets, as in you know, genuine industrial production, genuine uh, infrastructure building, people who are uh, behaving in a way which is consistent with common prosperity, which does enable you to still make good profits, but just not excess profits. Uh, and recognize that um, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not about hedge funds and private equity. Um, it's much more about, actually, ironically, as I said, good old fashioned 19th, 20th century Western industrial capitalism uh, is now being replicated across Asia participating in that, uh, I think is, uh, is, is where we should be looking. You have written extensively about the three zeros, interest rates, COVID, and carbon, and how such policies have wrought havoc on investors. At least the first two are receding. What policy mistakes worry you most moving forward? Yes, yeah, so exactly. The, the, the triples, the triple zeros, and the, the, the ironies they've been imposed pretty much uh, universally across the West. Uh, none of them were ever in a, a political mandate. They've, they've come from sort of on high, if you like. Zero so interest rates are unwinding. Uh, they've got a bit further to go. My worry with those, as I, as I hinted earlier on, is that uh, certain countries like uh, the UK um, and uh, peripheral Europe, Australia, New Zealand, where there's a heavily indebted um, housing market using largely short term interest rates. Uh, as their basis. You know, if they tighten too aggressively there, I think the consumer could get hit unnecessarily hard if they try to follow just lockstep, much less impact in the US and, uh, and uh, Germany and France and so on. So there's still a bit of worry about that. Uh, zero COVID, obviously, you've still got a legacy in, in China, but that is now opening up. Uh, I think hopefully we're, we're past that, although the authoritarians are still waiting in the wings trying to 
shut us down for any other excuse. But I think really of the three, it's the zero carbon that worries me most. It's become a giant industry in some areas, it's always the religion. Uh, and obviously it drives us the whole ESG uh, side of things. But my concern is, is that the financial sector is, is quite literally making money out of fresh air. Um, it is creating carbon credits uh, and then it is uh, forcing people to buy them. Uh, so you, uh, you give an emerging market a lot of carbon credits. A politician is very happy to do that because it's like, look how nice we're being to you in the West, giving you these carbon credits. You can now sell them uh, back to our uh, Western uh, manufacturing companies. And the Western manufacturing companies have got along with this because actually what that means, of course, is, is they've got the right to produce the product and the uh, emerging markets just sold that right. Now what's going on, of course, is uh, again with investment, not just from China, but particularly from China, a lot of these emerging countries are going, no, we want to hold on to those credits. Thank you. We want to do the manufacturing. So we end up with a situation where you actually have um, you know, a lot of the West is threatened with deindustrialization because actually for the first time ever, it's made it more expensive uh, to have, it made its energy more expensive. You've never grown with less, with more expensive energy before. It's always been, growth has always been driven by less expensive energy. Now we're trying to experiment with more expensive. And my concern is, is there's so many vested interests all over this, making money out of it, that the underlying industrial base in the West in particular uh, gets essentially uh, crushed uh, under this kind of, uh, uh, this policy. So I think for me, the biggest risk remains, uh, medium term risk remains this, uh, this zero carbon, uh, which is full of good intention, uh, but we know uh, where the road, full of road paved with those ends, I'm afraid. You recently raised the idea that this time may actually be different for European banks. And indeed, compared to the on-love sector, uh, to the energy industry in November of 2020, what makes it different? Yeah. Well, I, I think what's, what is different this time is this, this is not a normal cycle. We're not raising interest rates from a level of where banks are making good profits to a level where they make even better profits, but we don't like that normally because that then means we're going to slow the economy down dramatically and there'll be a lot of bad debts on the other side. What we're doing is we're raising interest rates from a level where banks have been unable to make profits for a decade and are priced as a result very cheaply uh, to where they now can make money. Yeah. Now, we then have to say, oh, that means you're, you know, you're dismissing the sort of the downturn. Now, we very much agree a downturn is coming but that's much more to do with the dramatic shrinkage in the money supply that we've already seen. But remember what's happened in the last 10, 15 years is the traditional banks have not actually done any of the lending, partly because they weren't allowed to post the financial crisis, and partly because this kind of ultra low interest rate world has created a whole kind of secondary shadow banking sector of all these fintechs and um, private equity, private credit leverage loans and so on, all those alternative products that are stuffed in pension fund portfolios, where those are the guys that were doing all the lending. And those are the ones that are going to have to make the bad debt provisions. So it seems kind of counterintuitive. However, interest rates going up now, particularly in Europe, because in Europe, they haven't paid out any dividends for a decade. They haven't actually bought back any shares in contrast to the US, where the US banks have bought back, you know, 600, 700 billion dollars worth of shares, whereas they've bought back about 12. Uh, now you've got a combination, therefore, of valuations that reflect they haven't made any money for a decade, uh, going into a period where they're going to make good money from their existing book. They're not done it. And they were also helped during COVID just to really uh, copper bottom those balance sheets. And the fact that all their biggest competitors, um, who are the sort of secondary banks, are, are all going to get hit very, very hard by the fact that their uh, cheap funding has just disappeared. So it's a kind of what's been the worst of all worlds for European banks. I'm not gonna say it's the best of all worlds, but I think it's, it's a very interesting story for me uh, and my colleagues at Tosca, um, you know, who are specialists in the financials area. You know, I'm looking at it just from the beta point of view, obviously they, they're much more in the kind of picking winners and losers. Um, but um, yeah, I see that I think is, uh, that's what is different this time. And when people say those are the most dangerous words in. In investment, 
But, you know, we haven't ever had a situation of 15 years of interest rates held below the cost of capital, followed up with an unprecedented lockdown of pretty much the entire global economy, which we then allowed to open up pretty much all at once uh, into the face of, you know, in 2020, 2021, the US Fed printed more money than in the entire history of the United States. You know, so they huge increase in the money supply. Uh, combined with ultra low interest rates, and now uh, a reversal of those policies. So that, you know, you can't say, I can't say there's anything from economic history where we can say, we know what happened last time. It is different this time. And it does seem a little bit counterintuitive, but if you sort of look at it from the bottom up, I think uh, it represents a really, really interesting opportunity, we think, uh, for, for traditional banks, and particularly the ones in Europe, because they've got that advantage, they've got these absolutely rock solid balance sheets and the ability and the desire to pay out lots of dividends and buy back lots of equity. You frequently comment on the noise traders. Explain to our listeners what you mean and where are the voices currently rising? So noise traders, I mean, essentially what the way we look at uh, what market thinking is about is it looks at the markets and it recognizes there are three tribes. Uh, there's the short-term traders, the medium-term asset allocators, and the long-term investors. And sometimes they all move in the same direction, uh, but most of the time they're kind of moving in, in opposite directions and working out uh, who's dominating at any particular time is partly what we talk about when we talk about making sense of the narrative. Who's, who's calling, who's calling uh, the direction of the markets and who's actually driving it? Most of the short-term noise, is what I call noise traders, are the, uh, the short-term, they're leveraged, and they're mainly in FX commodities uh, mm -hmm. and short dated bonds. And they've got a lot of leverage on. And the idea is, is they'll put a trade on and then they'll shout very loudly about the, the benefits of that trade, hoping to get the next person in, whereupon they will get out. That is true. Uh, and that's, that's a profitable way of, of making money. What they really want to do, the way they really make big money is if they can drag the next guys in, if they can essentially drag in the medium-term asset allocators as forced buyers of whatever they're pushing, whether it's oil or whether it's the dollar or whether it's bonds or whether it's, uh, it's equities. If they can force people who are essentially those medium-term guys, they're constantly looking at the benchmark. So they don't want to be away from the benchmark because if they underperform the benchmark, they lose their job. Uh, they don't tend to have leverage, uh, but what they are is very conscious of, of matching a benchmark. So if you can move the benchmark enough that they then have to follow in, that's when you get really big money. And that's actually what's happened this year. I mean, the, the CTA, uh, effectively the macro hedge funds, um, they've had their, their best year for 20, 25 years, just as the medium term 60, 40 asset allocators had their worst year. Um, because essentially the CTAs have, have set, set the tone uh, and they've been uh, short everything against the dollar. They've been short bonds, they've been short equities. Um, and um, they've been essentially long energy and short metals. Um, and they've been dominating the markets right up until uh, November uh, when they closed out the books, uh, running to um, essentially uh, running to Thanksgiving. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's very, very important to understand what they're doing. They don't always drive the markets, but this year they have done. Uh, and for, for next year, it's really going to be that dynamic between whether they put the same trades back on or whether they see it as being more profitable to take completely the opposite view that they did uh, and go uh, short the dollar and bonds and, and long equities and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's understanding the dynamics. And the final point I would make on that is that third tribe I described the long-term investor. For me, the definition of a bull market is when the long-term investor continues to buy the dips and a bear market is when they sell the rallies. Uh, and what we've seen, I think, in the, in the fourth quarter, they stopped selling the rallies. Uh, so I think that bear phase is over for now. They may resume, but I, I, I suspect the next phase is likely to be where they buy the dips. They haven't done it yet. So we're in that kind of middle ground between the two. And I think the noise traders are also looking at that and trying to work out which way is the, uh, is the open door for, for them to push uh, to try and uh, enforce some uh, equally powerful trades for 2023. Do you consider the years ahead may be characterized as another commodity super cycle? 
Yes, definitely. I mean, this goes back to uh, one of the issues I've had with uh, with uh, the uh, zero carbon. Um, I mean, most government policies, and certainly the ones that have been directed by the sort of the, the supranational level, um, have tended to not have the consequences that were intended, and only had the unintended consequences. And one of the con the unintended consequences of uh, uh, zero carbon uh, has been a massive underinvestment in uh, in commodities generally, but particularly sort of um, uh, mining uh, metals and uh, obviously oil and gas. Um, and um, you know, it's wishful thinking that we can just suddenly stop using these commodities. Um, and as China comes back next year, uh, away from zero COVID, I think that's going to give us another spike, short term spike, as we saw when the Western, Western economies came back. But I think it is part of a longer term uh, super cycle that's going to require a lot more investment and a lot more sort of pragmatism um, because you know while we might wish we can go away from fossil fuels you know it's not going to happen anytime soon I'm afraid um, and uh, investment is going to have to go in and in, until that investment is brought more supply on stream we're going to have this supply demand imbalance and, and hence the super cycle you know so I think it's very much a, a, a sort of medium term view. We probably have about 10 more minutes left, Mark, and I'm sure my family offices and investors have enjoyed your insight. Uh, again, many of them are very, very active allocators. So maybe switching a little bit of the focus to uh, themes moving forward in the upcoming year, and maybe we'll look at a couple of asset classes quickly round robin. What do you think are going to be the dominant macro themes for 2023? Uh, I think China opening up and the uh, and the commodity rebound is definitely going to be uh, a theme. I think um, the uh, the prospect of uh, a weaker dollar will play into that, uh, but more to do with the uh, the idea of allocation away uh, from the West towards the rest. So I think an allocation away from uh, a big overweight in dollar assets towards more in emerging markets, more in Asia, uh, is going to be. Uh, uh, and as I as discussed, uh, that into Europe, and I think the European banks uh, is a standout for that allocation of the, into the euro. Um, I think uh, elsewhere on the downside, we have got a recession, and I think it is going to hit Western consumers, particularly those with leverage balance sheets, the short, short interest rates harder than is currently uh, being expected. Um, but, it, but the flip side is, is that... Um, people without those negatives will, will attract a flow of capital uh, and capital will chase cap, you know, cash will chase cash and cash flow. So companies and sectors and people with strong balance sheets and good cash flow will prosper. Uh, and uh, equally, those with stretched balance sheets uh, will, will struggle. Um, and uh, I'm not saying it's going to be a complete inverse of, uh, of 2022, but I do think uh, we will get some inversion in both bonds and equities. Uh, the 60-40, I think, will will do better. I think the uh, CTA guys, you know, they'll they'll have another strong go at it, but it's unlikely they'll do as well as they did this year. They've got everything right. They managed to shake out a lot of of people, and they managed to push markets around. I think it's going to be uh, uh, more of a an even battle between those two two next year. But I think uh, the geographic diversification is going to be a story. Um, China opening up in commodities is going to be a story. And the inevitable slowdown as a function of the tightening of monetary policy across the West is going to be a story. But it's going to be uneven in terms of the, uh, of the way it impacts. And how about energy oil? How do you think that will play out in the coming year? Well, again, energy has has that long term super cycle behind it. Uh, I mean, obviously, the short term oil markets trade uh, as noise markets, uh, and they do focus on all, all their short term indicators. But the demand supply imbalance is still very positive. Uh, I think um, uh, energy, uh, in in terms of big problem in Europe, has been the sanctions, um, and uh, yes. so I guess you know here we get into the realm. Literary. So, if as and when those sanctions unwind, that will have big impacts on the uh, uh, on the short term prices, particularly of gas, obviously. Um, so, 
I guess those are ones I'd rather I'd rather wait and see rather than try and get in too early into those uh, into those areas. But obviously, you know, at some point, you know, all those end in negotiations somehow. So watching uh, and hopefully listening for some uh, negotiations and some resolutions and some way uh, relaxation of some of these uh, these sanctions was very important for the European in industrial sector, uh, and that again will have implications. Uh, for the competitive advantages that the US currently enjoys over European um, European industry, for example. So there's a lot of stuff to unwind, but you know, I don't mm -hmm. think uh, you don't have to put that trade on on January one. <laughs> and how about gold? Yeah, I think gold. Um, you know, gold. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? All, all the uh, all the gold pundits uh, who said what was going to happen to gold if we got inflation, if we got etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We got the entire environment that they said if that happened, the gold would go to 3,000 and everything happened, but gold didn't go to 3,000. Um, I do think now, though, uh, it's been more it's been more like a currency. It's been one of the currencies that's um, gone down against the dollar, which has gone up against everything. I think a weaker dollar uh, does help gold. A weaker dollar does help emerging uh, economies who've, who are short, you know, borrowed a lot of dollars. Uh, to uh, not China, but the, the rest of them. So, and those emerging markets uh, also like gold. You know, gold is uh, is something that is uh, uh, very uh, very popular with uh, savers and investors in India and China and uh, and Asia generally. Uh, so, I think uh, uh, as they uh, those economies prosper, that would put in an, an underlying bid. Uh, and then if it works as a currency, I see another bit. But I, I'm not a gold uh, pundit, um, but I can see uh, see the argument why people would have uh, an allocation of gold within their portfolios. And the other thing is you know, gold did struggle uh, with competition from uh, from crypto. Uh, and obviously, you know, they've had a hell of a year, as you might say. Um, so I think gold comes back before crypto does as an alternative to the dollar. Um, but the other point about uh, the dollar is we shouldn't just look at, against the yen and the euro and sterling. You know, we should be looking at the Singapore dollar and the Korean one and obviously the RMB, uh, even perhaps the Aussie dollar. Uh, so I think a lot of those cross rates are going to attract a lot of attention from the traders. I don't think the traders are going to be doing as much in the bonds and equities next year as they have this year. I think they're going to go back to their favorite haunts of, uh, of the commodity markets. Um, oil, gold, etc., and the currencies. So I think we'll hear a lot of noise in those markets. Um, but uh, for a long-term investor concentration on the bond and equities, um, I think it's going to be uh, a bit more bottom-up, fundamental-driven uh, than it has been for the last few years. And I believe my final question, and meant to be a bit of a fun question, because it's in <laughs> there is no perfect answer. And that would be if I'm a billion dollar single family office. And of course, all my billion dollars are completely liquid. I have a clean slate to be a long term investor moving forward. Mm. Broadly, how would you look at allocations to equities, bonds, gold, uh, real estate? Any opinion? We could bandy it about. Yeah. Um, I think. I, I obviously I would have a dominant exposure to equities for the reason being is that they are best suited for the environment that we are now in. Just by way of explanation, um, it, look at the things that have done very well over the last 50 years, and that includes the alternatives, it includes illiquids, it includes real estate, and they've all done very well because of uh, the ability to access very cheap financing and put on a lot of leverage. In the next uh, few years, we're going to have an unwind of all of that, which represents a really quite a serious headwind to those areas. It's not impossible to make progress, but um, if you're in uh, commercial real estate and uh, you know, you're up against somebody who's a distressed seller, um, it's going to be very difficult for you to um, you know, put up your prices, for example. Equally, if you're exposed to some of the uh, apparently attractive alternatives, um, and you find out that um, uh, there's a liquidity, an underlying liquidity problem and that um, as in the UK, all the uh, uh, institutional uh, pensions who were 
told these things were, were safe and now not buying them and they're actually sellers for choice, that creates a seller of rallies. So it creates a bear market for those particular assets. Gold, as we discussed, I think is a useful part of a portfolio, obviously. Um, but um, it's, uh, you know, I, I think it's a diversifier rather than a core holding. And bonds, as we also discussed, I mean, you have got a decent uh, yields here, but you've got better better yields out of cash where you're not taking any uh, any risk right. on the capital side and you're neither are you taking any credit risk uh, into a recession. So for me, it's got to be a strong bias towards a basket of equities. I would be diversified. I'd be global. Um, I would essentially be exposed to a, a, a barbell, if you like, a 60-40 portfolio uh, where one is much more aimed at um, capturing uh, a diversified sort of factor approach, whether it's, you know, suddenly whether you're going to be in value, whether you're going to be in quality, et cetera, those kind of factors. And the other side to have a sort of higher beta uh, where you're exposed again, again, I wouldn't necessarily take big country risks. I'd be, for the dominant part of my portfolio, I'd be exposed to some of those longer term thematics. The ones we used to have, you know, good, good old fashioned, you know, robotics and automation and digital health and, clean energy and but also you know the uh, the mining super cycle the energy super cycle the the infrastructure all that side of things there are all ways that you can play that um and then um definitely a bias towards emerging markets and as we've discussed in the in the conversation if you are going to get into kind of less uh liquid as in non-quoted areas to participate as, as co-investment opportunities uh, with, with businesses who are, it doesn't matter where they actually necessarily come from, but are exposed to the real growth areas, um, which are gonna be initially in Asia. In the medium term, there may well be a huge, you mentioned Russell earlier on, Russell Napier is talking about a huge CapEx cycle coming up. Um, as those CapEx cycles develop, participate in industrial capitalism, You know, participate alongside people who are building things that are gonna help build more things to sell things to people with real money and based on real cash flow and basically stay away from sort of manufactured derivative financial leverage products, which somebody's told you are safe because they apparently, you know, they've got low volatility or they've got you know, low track area to a benchmark. Those are kind of, uh, if, if you like, false guides, I would say, to where your risk actually lies. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I, you know, in that sense, focus on corporates, focus on companies, uh, rather than uh, um, some of these sorts of artificial structures. So it sounds like it may be a good opportunity heading into next year to families that have a lot of cash on the sidelines to possibly deploy it longer term. You're looking at more global equities, specifically in companies that quote unquote produce real items that are usable in today's world. Uh, a little bit, like you said, in the corporate bond sector, a little bit in gold. Uh, it sounds like you're not as optimistic on real estate moving forward. A lot of families, now there's some families that make their money in that, and they know the nuances in the market, but a traditional investing family still may have 15 or 20% in real estate. Do you think that could be too much? Well, again, you know, it, it, a lot of it will come from legacy, of course, and a lot right. of it, you know, they're looking at look at it from the long term, and they 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 can take that illiquidity. I mean, that is very important from a family office point of view, is that you can take illiquidity risk yourself, you can take leverage risk yourself. What you don't want to do is to buy into products that are claiming to be low risk, but actually have embedded within them. Uh, the, the leverage and the illiquidity risk, for which you're not getting compensated for taking. So that's really what I would say. I, I'm not claiming to second guess on the individual uh, aspects of, of individual properties that are owned by families. What I'm saying is be wary of buying into third party products that are sold to you as being somehow safer or guaranteeing a return when actually the return is coming from the underlying manager taking risks that you aren't really being compensated for. So, um, yeah, if you've got your overall portfolio and you, you have a lot of property in it, it's the last thing you want to be doing is buying into, into uh, other products where you've got exposure to other people's property, which is in an environment now where um, you know, they may be fine, but what about all the uh, 
uh, all, the, all the other owners or all the, all the other uh, competitors in that space that they're in. And I guess it goes back to my definition of, I think you want to be in areas of markets that are either in or, or going moving into bull market phases and be wary of being in ones that are going to be in sort of, or move into bear market phases. So if you can see an asset that ultimately you yourself would sell on any rally, um, then uh, you know, understand that that's that's almost certainly the way that that thing's going to move into a, a period bear market and try not to get caught into a value trap just because everything's sold off this year. Um, so people can say, oh, it's cheap now. We'll get paid to wait because it's paying this yield. Yeah, but you know, cash is paying a good yield. Uh, and uh, the probability of, of, a, of a 20, 30% loss in cash obviously is zero, whereas in a lot of these things, it still remains quite a risk to your portfolio a further sort of write downs uh, from a firm, uh, so value traps. So just be wary, wary of value traps. And remember that a lot of the, the heroes did really well only because they had cheap money for a long period of time. And now that money is gone, even if it isn't going up in price really aggressively, uh, the, the whole rationale behind the business has, uh, has gone. So if you wouldn't buy any more, then you should think about um, maybe selling some of the stuff that you've already got. All good points. Mark, I wish we had another half hour to do a deeper dive into some of the topics, including the last one. We could have went a little deeper into it, but I think this has been very valuable for our audience. So I'll give a little bit of a close and an opportunity for you to share your information so our audience could, of course, reach out to you. Uh, this is the podcast. The interview is an opinion both of mine and of Mark's. It doesn't necessarily represent our underlying companies. It's meant to be an opinion. It's meant to be educational and somewhat entertaining. It's an opportunity at this given time. If you watch this two years from now, a month from now, maybe the views are totally different. So at the end of the day, yep. you need to understand your liquidity needs, where you stand as an investor, and you need to do your own diligence and make your own decisions when you invest. Because always remember, you could always lose money like many of us have done this year. Uh, so what I'm going to do, Mark, is I'm going to give you maybe a minute or so to explain a little bit about how people could connect with you. Maybe it's social media, maybe it's your market thinking limited, uh, your newsletter and platform there. And for those investors that would like to find out more about a Tusca fund, uh, how they can learn more about all of that. Okay, well, thank you very much, Angela. Yes, yeah, so I have a blog, uh, market-thinking.com. Uh, please uh, have a look at it, subscribe, it's free, uh, where basically I try and, uh, as the subtitles, make sense of the narrative and try and understand what's going on in markets and uh, hopefully highlight uh, areas that uh, could be worth uh, further investigation. Um, I also uh, work with uh, the Tosca Fund. Uh, I'm based in Hong Kong, which is why we spent some sort of time talking about China. Um, but uh, Tosca Fund, uh, Hong Kong, I'm uh, going to do a, a joint venture with them uh, to launch a fund, actually, uh, aimed at, among others, family offices. So, uh, uh, so uh, toscafund.com.hk uh, is going to be the Hong Kong website, is the Hong Kong website. Uh, and uh, shortly we'll be um, uh, highlighting more details of, uh, of Tosca Fund uh, and its new product involving me there. But in the meantime, uh, toscafund.com uh, in London has a, a number of uh, interesting products. Tosca Fund actually itself is best thought of in many ways as a family office. So uh, we create products for us uh, and we invite people to essentially invest alongside us. So it's very much a collaborative thing. Uh, it is, uh, you know, we have a family office mindset uh, and um, hopefully uh, um, we may be uh, able to work with uh, some of the, uh, the family offices here uh, in the future um, to uh, invest for the, uh, the common good. Uh, and all I can say again, Angie, thank you so much for your time. Uh, and uh, it's been very, uh, very uh, good fun for me to, uh, to come on to, onto your show. And uh, we are very, very much kind, appreciate it. Mark, and I enjoyed our discussion. Uh, are you active on Twitter or care to share any of your social media handles? 
Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't do Twitter at the moment, but I do use LinkedIn. Anything I post on market thinking, I will also post on LinkedIn uh, under my name and there's also under the company name of, of market thinking. Um, but uh, as we uh, get more active uh, with the fund, um, we will use more social media. But again, we are, uh, you know, we're primarily um, uh, uh, aimed at professional investors uh, in terms of what we're doing. So uh, from a regulatory point of view, uh, we have to be uh, as exactly the same uh, caveats that you yourself gave. That these are not uh, uh, investment recommendations. They are for information and hopefully entertainment purposes only. Excellent, of course. And everyone, it's been a pleasure to have Mark Tinker, Chief Investment Officer and Managing Director of Tusca Fund HK Limited, and also the founder of Market Thinking Limited. We highly recommend his blog. Go there and subscribe. It's for free. Uh, I really enjoyed the discussion. Everyone, I'm Angelo Robles, the host of the Angelo Robles podcast, the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. You can learn more about us on my various social media platforms. Mainly, we're at Family Office on Twitter and YouTube. And you could find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and all that as well. Do a little bit of homework. You'll find it. It's easy. And our website at Family Office Association is pretty simple. It's our company name, which means it's long. FamilyOfficeAssociation.com. Uh, thank you all for listening or viewing in. And again, thank you so much, Mark, for being a great, has uh, a great <laughs> guest. I would also like to thank a special acquaintance and friend of both of ours, and that would be David Talbot, uh, who's an amazing gentleman, very, very active in the community of investing, very much a global perspective, and really has been a wonderful source of some of the great guests that we've had on over the last couple of months, him and the whole team do a tremendous job there. So again, from the sidelines, thank you so much, David. I always appreciate your support and look forward to seeing all of you soon. Thank you so much.